Well, hello, and welcome again to the 2012fad.com. I'll be your host for this evening, and my name is Charlie Bluehawk. Last night, we talked about words never to use. Words that automatically, whenever we are talking to an audience of one or more, these are words, terms, phrases that absolutely guarantee that whoever we're talking to, their minds will shut off, their attention will turn off, or they'll simply burst out laughing at us. Terms like New World Order, Conspiracy Theory, Reptile, Soulless, Entity, you know, whatever. We immediately lose our audience. See, the enemy has something going for them that you and I do not have. They have beautiful lies. Where all you and I can do is offer ugly truths. The problem, of course, with a beautiful lie is a, a lie does not exist all by itself. You have to tell other lies to keep it going. And then you have to tell other lies to keep those lies going. And eventually you're just simply buried in lies. Now an amazingly good example of this was New Zealand, where for 40 years the people of New Zealand have been lying to themselves about everything. The best example I can I can give you the simplest example is in a corporation in New Zealand. They have a problem in IT. And it's not even really a problem. It's a minor issue that for a few thousand dollars and for somebody to step forward and take responsibility to see that this issue is resolved, it's done. No big deal. But in New Zealand, there's nobody there who knows how to manage. There's nobody there who knows how to fix the problem. They'd have to actually admit, hey, I don't know how to do this, we need help, which they cannot do. Because a manager in New Zealand, their version of the Mandarin class, if any of them ever said, I don't know how to do this, the rest of his own kind, the rest of the Mandarin class, would turn on him like a pack of rabid dogs and rip him to pieces. So instead of saying, I need help, I don't know how to do this, we need to get a professional person in, they ignore the problem. They actually spend, instead of spending a few thousand dollars to solve an issue, they spend tens of thousands of dollars to hide something that's now a problem. And this goes on decade after decade, and because a lie cannot stand on its own, they have to tell more lies to cover it up, so that one little issue, a very simple thing that could have easily been fixed by someone who knew how, has now multiplied exponentially. So the little issue is now a problem which spawns other problems, which then spawn other problems. So for the last 40 years, they've buried themselves, the New Zealanders, in endless problems that there's no documentation for, there's no records of, no one would take responsibility for. So the New Zealand people find themselves exactly where Americans and the British find themselves, buried alive in lies. And I understand nobody wants the truth. The truth is very frightening. It's very, very ugly. But you know the interesting truth about an ugly truth. It hurts. But it only hurts once. It hurts. But then the pain's over. Then you're free. Then you can move on. A beautiful lie hurts forever. I've often said that New Zealand is the future of the United States if the United States had a future. Well, I'm pretty much looking at the United States has caught up with New Zealand in the levels of lies, beautiful lies. But now all those beautiful lies are falling apart from their own, the weight of their own ugliness. And guess what? Now we've got the ugly truth. I was going to talk about the hedge funds of 1929 and how that was another beautiful lie. The hedge funds, they didn't call them hedge funds in 1929. They just said, look, you know, we're in prosperity, everything's booming. I'll let you buy shares in my company. You can have 100 shares of my company worth $1,000. It'll only cost you five cents. It's kind of an exaggeration, but to make the point. So you think, wow, five, for five cents, I can own $1,000 worth of shares. I'm a paper millionaire. Let's go out and party. All of a sudden, you don't have a job. All of a sudden, nobody has a job. 
all of a sudden you don't have the five cents to pay for that thousand dollars worth of stock. Guess what? The stock goes back to the guy who sold it to you. You've paid him money in the meantime. Interest. So he gets his shares back from you. He's made money from you by selling them to you. He's made even more money by you defaulting on the loan. That sort of business was outlawed back in 1929. The last couple of years it was made legal again. Now we call them hedge funds. And again, we're buried alive. alive. We're buried alive in a series of beautiful lies. And now we're looking at the ugly truth. But the thing about the truth again is, as ugly as the truth is, it only hurts for a moment. And then it's gone. Then you're free. But it's scary, and I can, you know, I can appreciate scary as much as the next guy. And so tonight I thought we would chat about, <clears throat> excuse me, what I'm calling human 2.0. And honestly, I don't know if this is a fairy tale, a story, or just a question. Because I've been trying to figure out, and please, I, I'm probably the slowest guy in the world. I really am. My IQ basically is the same as that of a warm glass of tap water. But the thing that's seen me through 25 years of corporate management and IT internationally in three different continents is the fact my thought process is very simple. Slow, plodding, predictable, pedantic gets the job done. And when I'm on the job, I usually can figure out what's going on just by looking around, but I don't say anything until I spend a couple of weeks, a couple of months, verifying what I think is happening and hoping to God I'm wrong. I'm so far to date I've never been wrong. But I always try to collect the facts before I say anything. Sometimes in these situations that you and I are chatting about that's taken me years, decades, to figure out. I mean, for goodness sake, I was sitting at a coffee bar a very dark coffee bar in, on Ventura Boulevard in Sherman Oaks, a suburb of Los Angeles, uh, 10, 15 years ago. I was sitting in a dark bar with a guy wearing dark glasses, and I could see through the dark glasses that the whites of his eyes were glowing, glowing red. And I didn't even think that was unusual until a few days later. <laughs> so I'm a little slow, but I eventually get there. And the thing that's been puzzling me, honestly, all these years, is I know that our masters, junior management in the corporation known as Hate Inc., the CEO, of course, is Satan. We can't say that, so we'll just call her the CEO. They hate us. They fear us. They despise us. The gibbering madness they have of us. Again, I saw all of this in New Zealand, in, in microcosm of what's going on now. And they want us dead, but they don't want us just dead. They want us to suffer horribly before we die. They want us to know torment and agony, which they're doing really well now in England and the United States. But they also know that a dead brown dwarf star is coming. And whether it flips the planet end for end, we'll find out, sadly. But it's going to have a lot of garbage around it, little rocks floating around it, which were already which are already hitting us. And Western scientists are pretty much convinced now, at least the Vatican scientists are convinced, it's going to hit the South Pole, Antarctica, and it's either going to be the planet flips end for end and the entire ice shelf just slides off the Antarctic continent. That's more ice than the Western I'm sorry, the, uh, what do you call it, North America and Europe combined. There's more ice covering the South Pole. It could cover all of North America and Europe and have room to spare. That's a lot of frozen water. And if that slides into the ocean, you're going to see a wave 5,000 feet tall moving at the speed of sound. And it's going to circumnavigate the Earth. Done. Or planetary junk Let's say we don't flip end for end, and just it's junk, uh, pieces of rock start hitting the South Pole. Because apparently, the dead brown dwarf star is heading at us from the Southern Pole, what we would consider the Southern Pole. 
And if the South Pole melts, pretty much the same effect, only a lot slower. You're going to see water levels go up 300 feet. Los Angeles is gone. Paris is gone. London is gone. Hong Kong is gone. Australia is gone. New Zealand goes one way or the other. Sort of nature cleaning out the trash. But our masters, junior management, know this. So why the tremendous, massive, gibbering urge to kill us before the event? See, that never made any sense to me. I couldn't figure it out. Why bother? Even the most basic moron masters know now, those that were left on the surface just die with the rest of us, even they must know by now, no matter how stupid they are, well, let's face it, these are not geniuses we're dealing with, even now they must know. I mean, goodness gracious, I saw a report on CNN a few days ago where on CNN they're saying, hey, scientists just found a dead brown dwarf star outside of the orbit of Pluto. That's eight times the size of Earth. This was on Western News on CNN, which is, of course, completely controlled by our masters. So again, why do they want us dead before the event? Because no matter what happens, most of us are going to die, and probably die quite horribly. So why? That seems like an awful lot of effort for a bunch of lazy bastards. So I'm trying to think in my plotting, pedantic, predictable sort of way. And then I thought about, well, the elder race. If they existed, and there's evidence that giants have existed on this planet for as long as you and I have been here. If you do a keyword search on the internet, four words, out of place artifacts. That will take you to some interesting places, but one place it will take you to is to a piece of stone that at one time, millions of years ago, was just wet sand next to a riverbed. And it very clearly shows human fit footprints, you, me, any of us, walking through the mud. And at the exact same time, in the exact same place, there are footprints of dinosaurs walking in the exact same mud at the exact same time. And it also shows very clearly the footprints of giants, in this case, 14-foot tall giants. They could tell because they could measure the stride of the footprints. So you've got three sets of footprints in the same place in the same time, crisscrossing each other. So giants exist. And then I thought, well, planetary lightning. As the dead brown dwarf star passes through the plane of the major solar system, which was us, and passes between us, the Earth, and the Sun, there's going to be a massive discharge of electrical energy because the, en the universe is electrical. Now, the fact that the dead brown dwarf star has at least three planets that we know of, one of them is inhabited because I actually was with a group of CIA agents, and for some reason people talk about anything when I'm in the room. And this has happened to me since I was a small child. I've heard the most amazing conversations. People don't seem to notice I'm in the room. I've heard the most amazing conversations in corporate offices while I was working on people's computers. Um, it just seems that I'm invisible. Or people are so comfortable around me, they'll just tell me anything and never realize it. So here I'm sitting with these five CIA agents. I had met them to talk about a, uh, a business plan I had for a fifth television network, this one on the internet, called the Internet Video Broadcasting Company, the Cyber Television Network, because I had developed software that would broadcast video down to a 33.3 modem, full screen, million color, Dolby sound, the whole bit. And I had met with them because one of them claimed to have $650 million trust fund that he was administering. And in the middle of this conversation about my project, which of course wasn't right for them, but they stole the business plan anyway, they were talking about how easy it was now for the Earth and the corporations on Earth to do business with the intelligent, civilized planet that was orbiting the dead brown dwarf star. And for some reason, I'm in the room, and I, just, I guess they just felt really comfortable talking about these things <laughs> with a complete stranger.
And so I, I, I popped up and said, oh, is it about time for them to pass this again? In which case they, at which point they remembered I was there. So anyway, the universe is electrical. Every 32,000 years, like clockwork, the dead brown dwarf star with its three satellites, one of which is inhabited and we've been doing business with, passes through the plane of our solar system. Massive electrical discharge, planetary lightning, lightning, electrical discharge, leaping from planet to planet. And we have cave paintings on our world, on every continent, thousands and thousands and thousands of years old that display in, you know, whatever you call cave paintings, that lightning was raining outside of the cave. Lightning like it was raining. There's so much energy. Now, from what I can tell, that planetary lightning actually dry cleans the earth, cleans us. It's a massive detox. It's very brutal. It's very brute force. But it gets the job done. So now I'm thinking, you and I, the only difference between you and I and a pond of water, a puddle of water, is a couple of pounds of chemicals and electricity. What if, as the dead brown dwarf star passes, and what if the planetary lightning that dry cleans the earth and gives us a freshly pressed, clean world to live in after, it pa after the dead brown dwarf star passes. What happens if not only does the planetary lightning clean the planet, what if it also cleans us? Because the major problem, besides the fact that 98% of us are just cattle, but we're poisoned cattle. Our masters have gone to tremendous lengths to make sure that our bodies are polluted beyond imagination. And when your body is poisoned, your mind is poisoned, you just, you just can't think. Now, I personally have gone through, to date, 10 major detoxes. The first nine started back when I was in the States. I just had one the other day. And to say the word explosive <laughs> doesn't begin to describe it. But when you start getting these poisons out of your body, and your body has the opportunity, oh, you're not eating any more poison? Oh, thank God, I can get rid of what I've got inside of me, and explosively discharges the, the poisons out of you. And you can't possibly, can't possibly ignore it. What happens if when the planetary lightning cleans the earth, it also cleans us? What if we discover in that moment between the planetary lightning and the wave wiping us out, that all of the poisons in our body are forcibly ejected from us. Now, I know this is possible, especially with uh, something called ozone. Ozone is sort of like oxygen on steroids. And if you have an ozone generator and you're stupid enough to be a smoker or you drink a lot or you do drugs, and you walk into a room that has a very high ozone content, the ozone generator is up on high and you walk in the door, your body says, oh, thank God, oxygen. And it literally squeezes <laughs> the cells in your body and starts forcibly ejecting all of the poisons. If you're a smoker, it's the um, artificial nicotine and the artificial formaldehyde, which is basically being purified by your body. Your body is being used as like a filter. And all of a sudden, stuff is being ejected forcibly from both ends. The poison is coming out because your body says, oh, thank God, oxygen. Because the oxygen content in our world today is so low, you and I are constantly suffocating. There just isn't enough oxygen in our environment to keep us healthy, or as healthy as we should be. The human body was never designed to wear out. The human body was designed to, to live for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. The problem is we don't have enough oxygen. We're eating poison. And our magnetic field is virtually non-existent. The three things that we need to live a normal life, which is thousands and thousands of years long. So I know a massive detox is possible. I used to have ozone generators before I'd leave everything behind in the tragedy that is New Zealand. And they were wonderful. It smells like, uh, well, lightning on a rainy day. 
So here's where I think I now understand why our masters want you and I dead, and dead horribly. What if the planetary lightning cleans the earth, but also cleans us? What if each of us suddenly discover we're detoxing, really massive detox, but all of a sudden this lightning, this planetary lightning, just being in that much ozone, clears us out. So if your body has no poison in it anymore, you can think, probably for the first time in your lives. You can reason. You can realize, I'm a human being. I'm not cattle. It gets back to what we talked about the other day. I am. I am that I am. I am myself. I'm no one else. I'm not a cog in a machine. I'm not a cookie out of a cookie cutter. I'm an individual. Now, I'm beginning to understand why our masters are terrified of us and want us dead before the event. Because if the event, the lightning, that leaps from planet to planet cleans the earth, it also cleans us. We go from being seven billion head of cattle to seven billion thinking, aware human beings. Now our masters have a problem, a massive problem. We go from seven billion head of cattle to seven billion men and women. And honestly, there's only a few thousand of them, at most. Now I understand their fear of us and why they want us dead before the event. Because if it's the lightning, if it's just the cleaning of our bodies, then it's really, really simple. Stop eating poison. What if, in the 2.5 billion years you and I have been on this world, this, our home, what if our older brothers and sisters didn't leave before the event? What if they left after the event? What if having their bodies detoxed, that extra oxygen, that extra electrical charge, actually woke them up, but after the event? And traveling through the universe isn't that hard. The universe is electrical. If you go online now, look up on the U.S. Patent Office. The last time I looked, I think there were like 127 U.S. patents granted for flying saucers. How stupid must we be that we don't see that? So if our older brothers and sisters left after the event, after their bodies have been cleaned, after they could finally realize, I am. I am myself. I'm no one else. I'm thinking. They look around and go, oh my God. How could I have been so stupid? How could I let my world become this way? I mean, I was that way as I was detoxing back in the States. I just started eating organic food. And every time I detoxed, it was like an icky, ugly, green, slimy, transparent curtain, like you see at the theater, sort of oozed its way up in my vision, like someone pulling a curtain up. And all of a sudden, I could see more clearly. And I looked around and said, oh my God, I live in this dump? I live in this filthy, dirty town? What the hell was I thinking? So if 7 billion people suddenly had that happen to them, our masters are gone. They're gone, and they know it. So this is what I'm thinking about now. And what if, as our older brothers and sisters left the earth, no big deal, easily done, and they left after the event, and after the event is over, and the dead brown door star goes on its way, leaving the plane of our solar system, leaving us a brand new, fresh, clean Earth to live on. And it's a scientific fact that you and I are the descendants of only 25 survivors of the last event. Now I'm beginning to wonder 
if those 25 survivors actually, they weren't morons, they weren't idiots, they weren't the dregs of the earth that were just left behind because they were too stupid to do anything else. What if they were willing volunteers? What if they, of our older brothers and sisters, were the best and the brightest left after the event? And they looked at their friends and says, no, you go on, go out into the universe, explore, we'll be here, we're going to rebuild the earth. What if you and I are not the descendants of the, the idiots, the morons who were too stupid to take shelter, too stupid to leave? What if they were the best and the brightest? And they're our ancestors, we come from them. They were our mothers and our fathers which means that you and I are the descendants of the best and the brightest of the last event. Now I understand, I think, why our masters are terrified of us and why they want us dead before the event. What do you think? Fairy tale, question, story? Let's find out, because it looks like we have very little choice. And I now, of course, now understand I am. I am myself, I am no one else, I am just me. And that's what the ancient Celts, I think that's what they meant by this blessing. May you live as long as you wish. May you love as long as you live. For the 2012fad.com, this is Charlie Blue. The 2012 fad is brought to you by Coffee and Blood, Love Letters Between the Dead, a series of five erotica horror novels about a fallen angel finding his way back to regain his own soul, and how the CIA war against the human race, their black magic, captures and traps him in the body of a mind-controlled slave designed to hunt down and to kill their god, their Satan.